In today's episode, we're talking about how to be more profitable in your business. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Entrepreneur Hour Podcast and Entrepreneur Hour TV, where we create superhuman entrepreneurs. I've got a, an awesome guest today, and it's going to be a topic that, honestly, we need to talk more about in entrepreneurship. And it's one that I experienced. I'm going to tell Mike a little bit on my story as we kind of, his story and my story are eerily similar. As I read the book, I had like goosebumps. It's like, how is this possible? Uh, but, but these people that are, these entrepreneurs are working their butts off and they're generating all this revenue and they're broke and they're not paying themselves anything and their businesses are not profitable. Right. And so I love the name of this book that Mike and Mike, you got to help me on the last name. And I've been trying for, for a month, oh, yeah, no, month no, no, to know how to say it properly. And I should have asked you before we start recording. So uh, it's, it's McCallowitz. McCallowitz, Mike McCallowitz. So profit first is a really intuitive way to approach just how you view your business. And, and it's literally fundamentally profit first. So Mike, welcome to the show, man. Chris, welcome thank you, brother, for having me. I appreciate this. Yeah, dude. So I, I want to get into a little bit more of your story. I kind of alluded to it here briefly. Um, but, but what spawned this profit first mentality? I know there are other books that you did and successes you had in entrepreneurship, but why was this so fundamentally important to you and how did it change your life and the lives of other entrepreneurs? Yeah. So uh, I've been an entrepreneur my entire adult life. I had some early wins, meaning I, I sold some companies uh, and became very wealthy in my early 30s, but thought as a result, I knew everything. Yeah. And admittedly, when I ran those businesses, they were both in the tech space. I was running those companies. They weren't profitable when I was operating them. They yeah. were surviving check by check. Uh, I had to refinance my house to cover payroll a couple times. Jesus. Times. But when I sold them, I made money and I said, oh, okay, profit is when you exit. So, you know, pump sure. and dump companies. Started a third venture as an angel investor. Uh, that I, I sucked at. I had no right to be in that space. I didn't understand what angel investing is. Started 10 companies. They all collapsed. And um, I actually call myself the angel of death. I was so bad at it. <laughs> I, uh, I evaporated all my wealth. And that was the come to Jesus. I yeah. um, had I, I was on the verge of personal bankruptcy. I didn't do it, but I, I lost my home, yeah. lost possessions. And uh, I remember facing my family, my nine-year-old daughter, my other children, my wife, telling them that we're, we're done because of me. And my daughter ran to her bedroom, grabbed her piggy bank at nine years old and ran back to me and said, Daddy, since you can't provide for us, I'll become the provider. Jesus. That was the, that was, oh, I get upset about that. It was such a punch to the gut and so yeah. necessary. That I realized I didn't understand the basic disciplines of entrepreneurial success. I didn't understand profit. Yeah. So I, I invented profit first to serve my own needs. And this was 12 years ago. As it as I made progress and I made errors and changed things and tweaked it, maybe if three or four years later I wrote an article about it in, in the Wall Street Journal and it hit. And, and people were asking me like, you know, how do I do this? And that was the impetus behind the book. Yeah. And the book came out now uh, three or four years ago. Yeah. Well, I, I got to tell you, man, the, the time is nothing but serendipitous here. Um, and I can talk about this because at the time that we record this, I probably shouldn't talk about it. But the time after it's published, I can now talk about it. And what I mean by that is I have a court date Monday for my previous business. I'm being part of what happened is that business failed for reasons like you're talking about. It was this oh. big calamity and um, I lost my health. Like, I, you know, just running around being stressed, working 18, 20 hour days. And that's, I told you I can't have coffee right now because my doctor's like, your body can't handle it. Dude, that was three and a half years ago. And I'm still in recovery from that business, right? Oh, I'm so sorry. I mean, it was unbelievable. So part of that was we were in, we were in cap, we were in fundraising mode. We were raising our series A and I took basically a bridge, a bridge loan to kind of, you know, we had some things that we needed to invest in and it was like, okay, investors want to see this, but we're not there yet. So how do I bridge that gap? Found a high net worth gave me a $100,000 loan effectively. And that company, as I got sick and found out like, hey, doctor said, dude, you keep going to this pace, you're gonna die at 40. Like that's realistic for Jesus, you. Like yeah. you were in terrible shape. I haven't seen anybody for your age in 35 years of practice as bad as you are right now for, for your age, not, not in general, just for your age. So business, business imploded, litigation happened. Everybody's calling their notes. They're trying to come after me. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. All that fun stuff is just horrendous. Not to mention dealing with health crisis. I'm so, sorry, man. I, yes. I, I can relate to so much. I did a road show too for my second company. We were in the computer crime investigation industry. Yeah. And in my head, I convinced myself I'm doing this road show to VCs to, uh, to raise money for faster growth. Honestly, the real reasons behind it was we were cash flow negative. I was yeah. struggling. It was, it was a panicked response. Yeah. I was yeah. trying to justify its logic. And I also get that physical stress. 
Yeah. Like if we don't have financial stability, we often don't have physical stability. And, and I started having blotches on my face and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I can totally relate. It's yeah, horrible. Man. It's it's tough, dude. And so you see people come in and I would say this, you know, but the dream dies when the bank dries, right? And like we come into this thing, we're so excited about an entrepreneurship and then real world happens where you owe 50, 60, to possibly even six figures in payroll and you've got 24 hours to scramble to figure out where it's going to come from, yeah. right? And so, so let's talk about the solution because I, here's the deal. As I read your book, I started thinking about, I'm like, in my situation, and I think it's the situation for many, I don't think that there's this perception of entrepreneurship from the outside looking in. It's like these guys are just greedy and they want to go on these luxurious, luxurious vacations. Stuff like that. For me, and, and, and I, you know, I'd let you kind of fill in the blanks and see if this is what it was for you. Um, I was telling myself I was feeding the beast, which you call Frankenstein, right? I call it feeding the beast, meaning, what did you say? Build it, sell it, move to the next one, right? Yeah. And so I'll make the personal sacrifices and not pay myself handsomely for my work because that means, and we experienced accelerated growth. So I was kind of proving that that methodology was correct, not unlike what you did. So I think that some of us, we just get off on the wrong path or maybe we've just misinformed. I think it's also kind of synonymous, like struggle and entrepreneurship. So I think we become a martyr for that to some degree. Yeah. But talk about what goes on in people's minds as to how they end up in situations where they're neglecting themselves and their businesses to such a high degree. Well, well, it is promoted aggressively that it's all about top line thinking. You know, I travel a lot. Anytime I walk through an airport, it frustrates me to walk by and see all those business magazines. And it consistently says, this company grew, you know, from 1 million right. to 50 million or 100 million. And it all points to top line thinking. Yeah. The fact is, the top line number is simply a vanity metric. You know, you've probably heard that before. Yeah, vanity and insanity, baby. And vanity is exactly. Yeah, and, and here's the here's the real definition of revenue. Revenue is organizational stress. What yes. I mean by this is every time we have a sale, the organization, our company has an obligation now to deliver on that sale, the product yeah. or service, yeah. which is a stress factor. And as a small business owner, the business owner takes on that stress. So increasing sales, increasing organizational stress, increasing personal owner stress. The, the balance to its profit. Now I'll tell you what the cause behind just the promotion of top line thinking. There's a fundamental flaw in how the numbers are calculated. And it's rooted, I believe, in gap accounting, stands for generally accepted accounting principles. What we're told is sales minus expenses equals profit. In fact, profit, profit is considered the bottom line or the year end. That's the vernacular we use. It's the crumbs. Yeah, and, and, and here's the problem. When something comes last in life, it means it's insignificant. Yeah. No, you don't call your friend, you know, bottom, you don't call your friends bottom feeders, I hope. Yeah. You know, if you love your family, don't say they come last. You don't, yeah. you don't say, my, you know, you have a health scare right now. You don't say, well, I'm going to start putting my health last. Right. Of course not. Yeah. Health comes first. Family comes first. Friends come first. First means prioritize. In the old formula, sales minus expenses means that's our focus. Sell as much as you can. And we hate to use the word expenses, but we love the word growth. So we say, sell as much as you can, facilitate growth. Sell as much as you can, plow back. Sell as much as you can, reinvest. And our focus is to sell to simply incur expenses. So most businesses, as revenue increases, uncannily, expenses increase at the exact same rate. Yeah. What we do in this formula, the fix is real simple. You flip the formula. It's sales minus profit equals expenses. By putting profit at the top line, now it becomes a focus center. And in execution, when we have a sale, we immediately take a predetermined percentage of that inbound revenue and allocate it toward a profit account. We hide it away from ourselves. It's, it's the pay yourself first principle sure. to hide the business. Sure. One of the things I love about that, man, is it's so, so I think that, that in many ways, um, we work against fundamentally who we are, the way that we're wired, right? And I love that what you do in, in, the, in the, you know, the example you give in the book that's kind of a really solid metaphor I felt was, give yourself a smaller plate, you eat less food, right? And, and we read The Power of Habit and in my book club, we've done a lot of things like that. And it's like, great book. we bang our heads against the wall, working against ourselves and then blaming our discipline, blaming our willpower. But in the reality of it is we have to set ourselves up for success. You have to treat yourself just as you would an employee. In many, in many ways, we don't do that. So I, I love that about what your approach entails because it's literally work with your human psychology, not against it, right? Like exactly. you're gonna fundamentally give priority over things you put first. Exactly. Yeah. Channel the outcomes you want. So yeah. what I did the product first, I looked at my own behavior and, and then ultimately countless other entrepreneurs and found that most of us, of us revert to what's called bank balance accounting. Yeah. Most entrepreneurs don't really. know, honestly, how to read a cash flow statement or a balance yeah. sheet or an income yeah. statement. And I'm one of them. I, I still don't know how to read those and I don't know how to tie them in together. But what I noticed in my natural behavior was I'd log in my bank account and based upon the balance, I'd make decisions. I got money, I can spend it. If I don't, I panic, right? Yeah. 
Well, there was a study in fitness um, that simply said, if you want to assure that you're gonna do that workout in the morning, observe your current path. This may have been in Charles Duhigg's book about intercepting paths. Mm -hmm. So I noticed in myself, every morning when I woke up, the first thing I would do is walk from my bed into the bathroom to use the bathroom. So I put my sneakers on top of the toilet. The mm -hmm. only way I can use yeah. the toilet now is by grabbing my sneakers and I've taken the first small step toward exercise. Yeah. Or they used to be in the closet. So I go to the bathroom and then I go make a cup of coffee and I do my routine and the sneakers were stored away. With Profit First, since we're doing bank balance accounting, I've we've set up the system that when you log into your bank account, you see different accounts at your bank and it must be there. You can't do this on a spreadsheet. You can't do it in your accounting system. It must intercept your behavioral path. You have the multiple accounts set up there and now we pre-allocate money to its intended use at the bank before we spend a dime. Now we're likely to work within the confines of what's available for what purpose. Yeah. So, so one of the things I, I also thought, of, I want to make a quick comment actually before I get into that. D do you think that looking at these companies that are just bleeding, I mean, purging cash, right? Immediately comes to mind, WeWork, Uber, right? Yeah. And they're banking on IPO. Do you think that given how public those have become, do you think more and more people are going to start to adopt profit first, given those notable, I wouldn't call them failures, but I think it's really changing our viewpoint of what success in a startup looks like. Would you not agree with that? Yeah, I would say it works for us and against us. They are heralded though, because I hear people say, I want the next Uber, or I want the next Twitter, or I want the next Google or whatever. And they're just picking companies based upon size. And even Google itself had to be funded for a long runway before it got traction and then sure. it became explosively profitable. Sure. But I think that's become the expected normal that we have to fund and sacrifice and hope that profit will happen at a turning point. Yeah. And what I'm saying is profit is not an event. Profit is a habit. We need to bake it into every transaction. And ironically, if you want to sell a business, if I'm going to acquire your business, Chris, the first thing I look at is, is this an ATM? Does it generate money without owner input? Meaning if Chris leaves, do I have, do I depend on him or sure. do I run independently? Secondly, is there a proven predictable cash flow system that generates profit month in, month out, hour in, hour out? Mm -hmm. And sadly, most businesses, they ramp in sales, ramp in sales, have no profit, and then they try to get an exit, but there's no, the yeah. EBITDA is zero. Yeah. So their valuation is down. Well, so, I think, yeah. sorry, go ahead. Well, I, just, I, think, I think the perception of Uber and so forth is those are the ones that make it are lottery winners and that's not the method for good investing. Yeah, and, and I think, so just in terms of perception and, 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 and this was my experience and maybe it was your experience as well, but you know, we tend to, we tend to have to measure everything with, with one metric, right? So you're in school, yeah. you get an A or you get an F, right? So, <laughs> so I think in, in business it's, do I have revenue or do I not? Yeah. And, and, and we use that uh, as an indication of our growth, of the company growth. But in actuality, you just were a good salesperson, right? You did one element right in your business. And I think a lot of people, what you realize is and what you talked about in terms of bandwidth and being able to actually keep up with that because it does add stress to the company. Yeah. And I think we need to kind of redefine what business and celebrate other areas of growth, right? Like automating a part of your business or implementing a new accounting infrastructure. Those give you increased scalability and things that we don't really celebrate like we do the revenue milestones. Yeah, so you know, sales is a source of nourishment to a company because sure. it's the creation of cash. But profitability is the source of health or stability. Yeah. So sadly, and, and it's actually interesting, in my next book I'm writing, it comes out in April, I've studied the hierarchy of needs that a business has. Yeah. So it, it, in the book, if I can kind of shoot a plug, it's, no, called, please. All right, it's called Fix This Next. And, and the reason I think it's important to share that is that most entrepreneurs revert to always selling more to solve a situation. Mm. But what I've tried to identify is there's a hierarchy of things that a business needs and you have yeah. to identify what to fix next in your business. Don't always revert to sales. In the book, I equate sales to oxygen. Like you need air to breathe, but profitability is the same as shelter and protection. Sure. It's, it's the roof of your head. Yeah. And metaphorically, businesses are shivering to death in the pouring rain and they try to sell more, meaning they try to gasp for air thinking that's gonna bring about shelter and they revert to the wrong action. Profitability is stability. We need to focus at that level far more often than focusing on just generating more sales. Yeah, I love it. Let's talk about gap for a minute. I know you mentioned it before. I want to make sure that we kind of loop back to that a little bit. Uh, the reason being is that as I read the book, one of the things that I thought, and I actually have an accountant in my, in my book club. And so I got to see kind of like firsthand, like some of the response to that, right? Um, and she was familiar with people that had asked about profit first, by the way. So it wasn't completely unbeknownst to her. Yeah. So you're, you are far reaching now, my friend. 
Um, not that you do already know that, uh, but part of what I'm thinking about is the transition from what I'm doing now. And, and in some cases, right? Like when, when you, if you've hit scale, making this kind of a transition, and this is why I like, this is why you said this in the book, you said, if you're just now starting out, don't look at that as a bad thing. That's that's great because you're starting yeah, yeah. on the right foot. Once yeah. once the wheels are churning, it's so hard to go back and course yes. correct and fix things, especially with your accounting system. Like that was the Achilles heel of my first business. Things just got out of control. And it was like, we're, anytime we brought somebody else in, getting them caught up was hard enough. And then going back and fixing the issue simultaneously, it was almost like, can we do a hard pause for six months and fix this, right? It was like the wet bar of soap, so to speak. So. Talk about the transition. I know you talk about taking action, doing it now, like all the things you outline in the book, which people can definitely go read and check out. Um, but but what are some things that you recommend maybe that you didn't talk about in the book as far as effectively making that transition? Is it working yeah. with one of your profit first professionals or how does that look like normally? Yeah, and, and uh, even that may not be the starting point, even though selfishly, I, I want people to use profit first professionals as an organization. But the starting point is, is really starting slow and let it grow. So. Um, we have over 300,000 businesses uh, that have implemented Profit First, and so we have thousands now of case studies of, of different lengths, from, from just a paragraph to pages. And what we found is that businesses that go full throttle into the Profit First system actually fail at a tremendous rate, unfortunately. Really? It's the businesses that baby step their way in that have mm. much more success. So, so Profit First, when you outline it, it's, it's all these different steps, but it is such an abrupt shift. It's like taking a, a freezing mug out of a freezer right. that you're gonna pour a cold beer into. Instead, you pour bo boiling water into it and it just shatters. It's yeah. too abrupt. So what I tell people to do is simply set up one account starting today and call it, make a savings account and call it profit. Then allocate merely 1% of your inbound cash flow, your income, into the profit account. And you're not gonna get rich doing this and you're not gonna drive tremendous amounts of profit, but there's gonna be a massive mind shift yeah. because now when you log into that bank account like most entrepreneurs do, now you see this new account called profit and you slowly see cash accumulating a cash yeah. profit. Yeah. What will happen, and we've seen this in the, the businesses that have reported to us, is then they say, well, what if I try 2% or three or four? And they start to grow that. And then they say, what if I implement the rest of the system? And most implementations of profit first don't happen you know, within a day, they roll out over five or six months. Okay, that's great to know. And then they're wildly successful. Yeah, so, and, and the shame is some people email me and they feel guilty. They're like, you know, I, I read Profit First, but it was too much and I didn't do it. I feel ashamed or I'm, I'm half-assing it. And I'm like, listen, if you got one butt cheek in there, you're, you're one butt cheek in more than anyone else. So it's yeah. okay to half-ass it. Yeah. Ultimately, the, the Profit First professionals are accounts and bookkeepers who are certified in this. Yeah. They're like, the, they're like the trainers for exercise. Like once you have mentally committed to it, they're definitely great guides to, to help really amplify the game. And I think too, if I may, I think one of the big things for, for me is when, when I read some of these books and I've kind of retraced my steps into to my previous business and kind of like what led to my health crisis and all these various things. And obviously like wanting to augment the way that I approach or refine the way that I approach business, right? Not unlike what you went through, kind of that like period of, you know, watching the infomercials and stuff like that. I will say yeah. I'm beyond that. I'm beyond that part of that process, oh, good, good. I will say. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to the couch after this. Um, <laughs> but, but I think for me and for maybe for many entrepreneurs that are currently experiencing this, just introducing them to, to a new ideology or to a new methodology and recognizing that they're not alone in this. This is a very normal, unfortunately normal part of what a lot of entrepreneurs experience kind of gives them hope and kind of gets them thinking about like awareness is the first step, right? Yes. Just knowing that something else exists that is an alleviation or solution in this case, solution to my problem, I think, is enough to start to create that windfall in that positive direction, whether you implement immediately or not. Would you not agree with that? Yeah, I do agree with that, that we have to become aware and we also have to agree with ourselves that what has we've been doing has not been working. Sure, um, totally and, good point. Right, so we, we have to be willing to give up on something. And uh, sadly, many people become comfortable in something that's not serving them, but at least it's comfortable because it's familiar. This is unfamiliar and that's the risk. Now we're moving to something that we've never done before. And there's a, there's a magnetism to staying stuck in what's not working just because it's comfortable. So we, we have to admit what we've done has not served us and there's a potential new thing and be willing to dip our toe in the water. Okay, cool. Now, as far as, so I mentioned the accountants before and such. So as far as gap, is there a reason historically why that was invented the way it was to not include profit first? And I don't, you know, I'm not trying to go into a history lesson here, but I do think it's helpful for people to understand why things were done the way they were. Yeah. So they have that historical context to be able to 
I don't want somebody to go to their accountant and the accountant, you know, give them a history lesson on Gap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Convince yeah. them why it's better than what they're doing. So can you give them some context or some information they can take with them to arm themselves? Yeah, yeah. So, so Gap stands for Generally Accepted Accounting Principles. It's mandated among large public corporations. Small companies do not have to adhere with it. That's a key function, but almost all of us do. Yeah. The foundational formula, sales minus expenses equals profit, that was created about 300 years ago with the advent of modern accounting. Yeah. And it is logically correct. That That's the thing. I'm not saying that's not a logical formula. Okay. You have to have a sum of money, subtract out what you've used of that money and what's left over is profit. It's sure. logical, it's simply not behavioral. Mm. Now, in the flipped formula with profit first, it's mathematically the same. The, the numbers work out identically. We're just reversing the process and taking profit first. The other thing I wanna point out is, uh, I'm not bashing accounting. Actually, accounting is a very powerful way sure. to track. And, and profit first is not an accounting system. There's some confusion there. Profit first is a cash Good point. management system. Good point. Yeah, so profit first simply manages the cash, but you still can and should use an accounting system. You still can and should have a accountant and bookkeeper yeah. for compliance with tax law, for managing the cash. What, what profit first does is allows you at a very real-time cash basis, see money flow through your business, allocate it to its intended use, but it also raises red flags. Like when you run out of money in your OpEx account, one of the Profit First accounts, when you run out of money there, that's your business speaking to you saying, we don't have enough money. Yeah, and when wrong. you can't pay your bills, you can't afford your bills. So yeah. that means there's a there's a flaw in the business or, or spending too much cash there's, or there's something wrong with margins. And that's where I call my bookkeeper or my accountant and say, listen, I have a depleting OpEx account. What do we need to do here? What's wrong with my business? And that's when we actually open up the QuickBooks, that's what we use, and investigate what's going on. I'm not that sophisticated to understand QuickBooks, but sure. they are, and then they translate it back to my my language so I can sure. understand, oh, we have a margin problem with this product. We should ab abandon the product or we should increase the cost, or the prices on it or something like that. Now are they, so in your situation, and as far as what you recommend, do you advise people to use profit first as your cash management system, but then your accounts are gonna take that and put it back into gap as far as your tax filings and reconciliations and such? Yes, minus the one little caveat, not necessarily gap, but yes, they'll, they'll apply it to accounting principles. Gap is just a standard, it, it, far more comprehensive than just that formula. Sure. There's certain elements that a small business maybe doesn't need to adhere to, cash basis versus accrual and stuff like that. But uh, effectively, yes, profit first is your cash management system and the accounting is managed directly by your accountant in, in conjunction with your bookkeeper. So, so, that, was, so that, was, that was the reason I wanted to make sure that I understood that completely because one of the, one of the major pushbacks that, that we've gotten as we've read this book is, oh my gosh, I'm buried already with all this work and now I have all this extra administrative work. And the problem is, Mike, is I think that most of them early until they get to six figures maybe and beyond, they're really just, hey, is there money in the bank account? Good, let's roll, you know? And so I think that's part of the problem. So is that there- is, Oh, that is the problem I'd argue. Right, so so is there a solution outside of, let's say, let's say solopreneurs haven't made their first hire. I, I agree, by the way, you gave ranges of like, don't hire anybody until you get the 500,000 and beyond, right? There's so many people spending all these money on salaries that they don't have any business spending. So another, if you yeah. don't read the book for any other reason, that part was amazing because that's <laughs> so true and so many people make mistakes in that yeah. regard. I'm trying to think of that gap between, pun intended, I guess, um, between the solopreneur that's literally just driving themselves into the ground, right? Yeah. And then handling the administrative aspect of doing a cash management system like Profit First while also doing tax filings and having something in place with yeah, their accounts yeah, yeah, and kind yeah. of having that battle. So how do you help them, I guess pun intended again, reconcile that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the perception is that Profit First brings complexity. The reality it brings simplicity. Mm. So what we're doing here is uh, uh, right now, most businesses have a singular checking account. They put their deposits in, especially small micro business. Sure. We see we have money, like you said, we spend it or not. But then we have to guess, is that money truly available? You know, for that, do we have outstanding checks that are being processed? Like right. what's going on? Profit first, we allocate money. As it comes in, we carve it up into five accounts. It, it literally takes under five minutes for most businesses, one time a week. Yeah. And it's a great way to reconnect with your cash flow because you get to see it visually as you do these transfers. Sure. So it is very low, very little amount of time. But now you get to see what's truly available for the operations of your business and you don't have to make any guesswork. Either you have the cash or you don't. Right. And the, so, and then the other element though is you may get resistance from the professionals, the accountant or bookkeeper saying, oh, the reconciliations to your point. This is gonna be so, so much more burdensome on the accounting. 
The fact is no, again, we have over 300,000 businesses doing this. Over all of our case studies, we actually found Profit First brings faster reconciliations Love because it. money is pre-categorized to its intended use. That's what I, that's what I yeah. thought. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, and, and listen, you know, I've been living this system for uh, 11 years now. I've had 43 consecutive quarters of profit distributions. My accountant, when I set this up, his name's Keith. He goes, dude, this is ridiculous. Like, <laughs> you don't need this. He yeah. goes, well, you just do what I've been telling you to do. Sure. And, and I told him, I said, listen, how many people, Keith, do you tell to do it your way? Just, you know, read the income statements up. He says, everybody. He's got 150 clients. I said, be honest with me. How many of them distribute quarterly profit distributions? He said, none of them. I said, how many of them post a profit at the end of the year? He's like, maybe 10% of my clients. Oof. I'm like, dude, wh why are you telling people to do That's something that only re yields 10% wins? Yeah. Yeah. So I said, just, I'm going to do this. Um, I just want your blessing that you'll support me, um, sure. even if you don't believe in it. And he said, okay, I, I am, and I'm not bragging about this. It's just, it's just a fact. I am his most profitable client. I'm his only client that, that posts quarterly profit distributions, except now he's brought on clients that do profit first and they all do quarterly profit distributions. Wow. And he's become the biggest advocate for it. That's awesome. So the, 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 the moral of the story is just expect resistance because people, including ourselves, are familiar with the traditional way exactly. and we haven't known another way. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. That's it's supremely helpful, even for myself included, because I was kind of lost in, in a little bit of gray on that as well. Um, last thing I want to talk to you about, we gotta we gotta let you go. Um, people that are on the flip side of that, people that are that are maybe in a situation like you or I were in. If there's anything that we could do, I, I can only speak on, on my own behalf, and I, I assume you'd agree with me on this. Um, even if it helps one person not have the same outcome that what we had, and obviously things turned out great for both of us, but it, as it relates to that specific experience, it's a tough one, right? And it's unnecessary. Yeah. Um, you had a friend that you talked about, Pete, million dollars, bank called that that line. Oh, yeah, yeah, Peter, yeah. A million dollars in debt, right? So I just talked to him this morning, literally talked to him this morning. Wow, crazy story, man. So so, kind of talk to the emotional side of what someone's going through and then how they can kind of get things back on the rails and not just say, it's over, it's all like, I'm done, I'm got to file for bankruptcy and stuff like that, because it is a mental game when you get to that point. Yeah, I, I mean, so, sadly for me and for so many other entrepreneurs I've interviewed, we do often need a heart attack, not a physical one, but a financial heart sure. attack or some calamity to, to finally accept that was what, the way we're doing things is not working and we give up on it. Sure. So I, I found there, there's a shortcut, not everyone can pull it off, but it's to fast forward your current situation. So if you're, you're disappointed with your current situation, look back at your history, how long has it been like this? And if you continue it, when is that heart attack gonna happen? Sure. Some people can make that visceral enough now saying, you know what, I'm giving, I'm stopping this today. I yeah. am angry and disappointed uh, at, at what I've experienced and I realize that I'm the responsible party. If we can get ourselves to say it to ourselves, okay. that will manifest change. Okay. The, the other part though is, is we're not, you're not alone. Like if you're experiencing struggle, hello, that's almost every entrepreneur. Yeah. And sadly, we're all stuck in this game of chat, pounding our chest. I was forever right. like, look how great I am, I'm successful. Yeah. I was dying inside. Yeah. So I want you to know you are not alone and you yeah. can change this. Okay, that's a great message. I appreciate that. All right, so we've talked a lot about the book. Uh, obviously, you have a lot of other books, but for this particular book, where can people go to learn more about you and the work you guys do at Profit First? Oh, thank you. If, if you want to pick up the book Lickety Split, just go to Amazon. You know, it's at all bookstores, but sure. go to amazon.com, type in Profit First. Uh, the shortcut to get access to all my books. I'm a podcaster too. I have Entrepreneurship Elevated and other stuff. It's all my website. No one can pronounce or spell McCallowitz. So there's a shortcut. Go to Mike Motorbike. Uh, it rhymes. And it was my nickname in high school. Okay. Ill for join. But you go to Mike Motorbike and click on apply now. What I've done is all my books, you know, free chapters, all my blogs. I used to write for the Wall Street Journal, all those articles. I give them all within one email. So you don't have to like subscribe for life. Sweet. You get in one email. If you go to MikeMotorbike.com and click on apply now. Perfect. Mike, I appreciate your time, man. It's a, it's a great read. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking time to, to join me. Hey, man, this wishing you tremendous health and thanks for your courage for sharing that story. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. All the best, my friend. All right, guys. Thanks for joining by and checking out this episode. Make sure you check out all of our resources below, all the links that Mike and I discussed, uh, as well as some, some awesome stuff that we're doing, including my VIP book club. And we talked about that in this episode. Uh, an awesome way to kind of read along with this stuff. These are complicated, uh, sometimes concepts, right? And so it, it helps to have the, the guidance of somebody who is actively there with you and myself as the coach and the, the curator of the community, but also an active community of people that are just like you, right where you're at and, and kind of helping you throughout that process. So I invite you to check that out. I have a link included below. You can get your first month for just $7 to my VIP 
Book Club. Grab that link. Use promo code YouTube to take advantage of that. Make sure to like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications, drop your comments below, share with a friend, and I'll see you guys in the next one.